This evening, Leon is excited to share some recent research he has done on the life and work of one of Manchester's most important artists, Catherine Lane Weems. Please welcome Leon Doucette. Alrighty. Alrighty, I think uh, I've heard I need to be careful with this wire. So I think if I cut out, I'm sure I'll notice too. Um, so thank you all for coming out. Uh, I'm really psyched to be able to talk to you guys about this a little bit. Um, before I get started, I want to thank you, John and Beth, um, for inviting me down uh, to, to have this conversation. Uh, as John said, I've, I've uh, worked for the museum for well over six years now. And uh, the Cape Ann Museum has been around for a long time. And during, it was founded in 1873. And from now till then, there have been a lot of historians. There have been a lot of really talented people that have delved into the history of the, uh, not just Cape Ann, but the greater North Shore. And uh, especially working under curator Martha Oakes, it's really rare to find a stone unturned, uh, some little historical nugget that you're like, oh wow, I've never, you know, I didn't realize that was a, there was this whole big narrative there that, that uh, uh, can be explored. So when John had asked me last summer if, uh, if I'd be interested in talking a little bit about sculpture to, to you folks, um, I had initially thought that I'd, I didn't want to just, um, take one of the narratives that I know so well from, from working so closely with the museum collection and just, and just translate that and just have it be the same thing, but that it could be an opportunity for me to sort of dive into some, some research and some, some uh, stories that I had never uh, known about. So, of course, with this being Manchester, I started with Weems. And uh, the more that I learned about Weems, uh, I kept seeing Grayfley's name come up. And I have to admit that I'm, I'm personally, a I mean, I'm, I admire both their works very much, but I'm personally uh, a huge fan of Charles Grayfley's work. It's, it's the type of sculpture that I was really interested in college and, and, I'm, and I'm very passionate about. So I'll admit that it was sort of my personal interest that uh, jumping from Weems and seeing how, how connected to him uh, that she was, I started to think to myself, like, wow, this is a really interesting story. And, and Grayfley is somebody who, for my generation, as a millennial, who, um, if something doesn't exist on Google image search, then as far as we're concerned, it usually doesn't exist. Uh, Grayfley was a tough guy to get to know for the last six years, because there's not a lot about him. I mean, it's funny to talk about somebody who died in the 20s as having a web presence, but he doesn't really have a web presence. So uh, I wasn't as familiar with his work as I was with uh, Walker Hancock or Paul Manship or George Demetrius or those kind of guys. So anyway, uh, that's sort of how this talk uh, got started. So um, having said that, I really wanted to focus for the most part on uh, these two individuals' student days because I think it's really interesting to, um, to see where they came from how they developed, and it's, the story isn't totally uh, symmetrical because um, Weems was a student of Grayfley, so as we're learning about Grayfley in the, in the first part of this talk, there's not going to be a lot about Weems, um, but then eventually with, with that groundwork and an understanding that I hope all you, that everybody here gets on the type of person that he was, uh, it, it, you can see how interesting uh, it becomes when, when their two worlds collide a little bit and get intertwined. So, um, so that is what I'm going to say about that. And uh, just to, to add to that, um, there are big monumental pieces that both of these individuals are known for. The Meade Memorial in Washington, D.C. for Grayfley, for instance, uh, and Weems' work in the, the, her dolphins at the aquarium or the rhinos outside Harvard or the, the freezes, the, like these are, these are projects these guys are well known for. And I figure because of that, I wouldn't take up everybody's precious time talking about things that you all are probably already a little bit familiar with uh, anyway. So having said that, let's start our story in Philadelphia. Oh, sorry, yep, there we go. So uh, I, the story begins in uh, Philadelphia in uh, 1862. Um, just as a little bit of background, this is the, this is the year that Grayfley was born. Um, this here is, is his little street that's uh, right next to the, the river here. Um, it's actually, this is all of 
uh, Philadelphia the year that he was born. So that's his street. And uh, this is the Philadelphia City Hall, which I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Philadelphia City Hall, but it's this amazing Beaux-Arts style building uh, that has, I think, 250 figurative and really intricate sculptural pieces all over, all over the building. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. And then this little guy right here is uh, Struthers Stoneyard. Um, so this whole little, little circle was, uh, this is uh, Grafley's neighborhood. And let's see, this is not advancing, but. Okay, so this is a sketch that uh, Grafley made. Um, when he was, when he was uh, 14 years old, his father was a, um, had split his time between farming and shoemaking. And he was a really strict guy. He had these deeply ingrained uh, Christian roots. And uh, to anything, uh, anything relating to the arts was sort of thought of as idleness in Grafley's family, according to his daughter. Um, so Grafley had to make an agreement with his father. His, the closest thing he could get to an arts education was to agree to uh, work for this stone yard where he would do stone carving. And he ended up uh, doing a four-year apprenticeship there. And uh, over the course of that time, started off just roughing out shapes that then the more seasoned sculptors or stone carvers would work on and then eventually worked his way up to working on um, doing the carving himself. And eventually, uh, by his fourth or fifth year, uh, he wound up doing some of the figurative work, and that made him realize his own shortcomings. He writes in some of his, uh, in some of his journals that he realized that there were these sort of sweeping curves of the human body that he wasn't really that, that he was. I can always try to project, too, if we need to. But let's see, testing, check, oh. sounds like we got something for a second. Do we think it's the wire? Could be. If I were to, if I were to project, can everybody in the back hear me? Okay, I can always just try to do that, maybe that's easier for the time being. I'll just, I might need to take a water break at some point. Anyway, where was I? So, he realized that he um, was having trouble making some of these, um, some of these amazing figurative pieces that were supposed to adorn the city hall. So, um, just to back up, this is the Philadelphia City Hall. This is a detail of some of the uh, sculptural elements that were included in the architecture. Um, the project was actually overseen. Is everyone familiar with Alexander Calder who, with the kinetic sculpture? Well, his father was later a friend of Grafley, but his grandfather, Alexander Milna Calder, was the sculptor who was appointed by the architect to oversee this project. Um, so the contract for creating all of these, I mean, there's sculptures all over this dang thing. Um, the contract was given to Struthers Stoneyard, which is that little blip back on the map. And, uh, Grafley had the, the good fortune to be working there when he did. He was exposed to a lot of Beaux-Arts style, um, not only architecture, but also uh, figurative work. So, as I said, he uh, realized that he uh, had some shortcomings as a sculptor, that he, in order to do a convincing human form, you need a little bit of training. So, uh, by this time, he was out from under the thumb of his father, he could make his own decisions, and he decided to enroll at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art. Um, this is Grafley here. I have no idea why he's wearing a wig, but, <laughs> but he is wearing a wig. Um, so uh, he, this is Grafley with some of his friends at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. I think this here, well, I know this here, is uh, Alexander Sterling Calder. So this is actually the son of the architect in between in between the architect and the, uh, and the kinetic sculpture, Alexander Calder. It gets confusing. Um, and uh, here at the Pennsylvania Academy, it was one of the, the leading institutions uh, in terms of figurative artwork in America. Um, he was lucky enough to be able to spend time studying under Thomas Eakins, or Aikens, <coughs> depending on who you ask. Um, Aikens was sort of a controversial figure in, not just in the history of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, but also in American art history. He, um, he was a, a passionate and fiery instructor. 
Uh, like Grayfley himself, he was, he's sort of almost better known as a teacher than, than an artist in his own right, but he's, but he's very well known as an artist as well. This is one of his pieces, uh, the clinic of Dr. Agnew, um, that uh, there's a, um, this is a, 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 either an operation going on here, and uh, Dr. Agnew was a well-known surgeon in the 1880s. And uh, the, one of the reasons that I chose this piece just to demonstrate e uh, who Eakins was is that uh, contemporary scholars look at Eakins and sometimes use this rare term, uh, anatomical realism, which is sort of funny. I don't hear it a lot, but uh, Eakins was a big proponent of, the, of understanding the anatomy of the human body. Um, Eakins came from a tradition that studied mainly, uh, you, you did a lot of your figurative study from plaster casts and, and other sculptures and that sort of thing. And Eakins at the Pennsylvania Academy just wanted students to skip that and go straight to working from the human body and had, um, had cadavers brought in, scheduled dissections, those sorts of things. And as legend has it, got a little bit wacky toward the end. Um, he, uh, he ended up getting thrown out of the Pennsylvania Academy at, uh, <laughs> at a certain point. Um, he was interested in photography, and, he was, and because of this focus on, on uh, the human form, he started to develop some, uh, some beliefs that started to be at odds a little bit with 1880s uh, society. So he was, uh, apparently he had at one point encouraged some of his students to, sculpture and, and to, to sculpt and paint in the nude in class. Um, so he was sort of trying to think beyond the, uh, the, what the human body represented in Western culture and was just trying to think like, it's a thing, let's not be afraid of it, let's learn how it works, let's learn how it moves. And so he, uh, as a photographer, he was a proponent of um, uh, what he called stroboscopic photographs. So would essentially, if you uh, were to take a long exposure photograph and then run a strobe light with somebody in motion, uh, you could see each stage, every time the camera flashes, you could see each stage of movement. So this is the sort of education that Grayfully would have been exposed to. Um, you can sort of think of, uh, well, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, at any rate, when, when Grayfully, or when uh, Eakins got thrown out of the Pennsylvania Academy, Grayfully uh, was joined a bunch of uh, Eakin students in putting together a petition to try to get him brought back to the school. And, and Grayfley's name was second on the list, just as, as an idea of um, how close they were. So at any rate, after a certain amount of time, uh, Grayfley decided that he went as far as he could go with Pennsylvania. And him and four of his friends decided that, they, that the gateway to fame and fortune, or at least notoriety, uh, was going to be across the pond in Paris. So, him and four of his friends booked a uh, passage on a steamer um, and headed for Paris and ended up enrolling at the Académie Julienne in Paris. And the Académie Julienne was one of two, uh, one of two schools that were um, the most prestigious schools, I guess you could maybe even argue in Europe at the time, uh, but at least in Paris. The other is the École des Beaux-Arts, which was nearly impossible to get into uh, it involved, you had to be fluent in French because they didn't offer instruction in any other language. You, you had to be a man. Uh, so there, and, and on top of everything else, the entrance exam was nearly impossible. You had to draw a random bone from the human body from memory and give like a brief history of Western culture and do, do, a, do uh, t different timed, like under armed guard almost, timed figure drawings and figure sculptures and things. Uh, we can, we'll, that'll come up a little bit later. But at any rate, the Academy Julienne was no less prestigious for the most part. Um, a, a, in fact, there's a lot of, uh, the, at the Cape Ann Museum, any, any artist who spent time in Europe, for the most part, with the exception of maybe Walker Hancock, uh, seemed to have at least had some association with, um, with the Academy Julienne. This is a, a little bit of a later photograph, but it, it uh, is an example of what a sculpture or modeling class uh, would have looked like. All right, so here is another class photo. This is Grayfully, he's a little bit older. Um, this is uh, a classroom at the Academy Julienne. This is his professor, Henri Chapoux. Um, I, I just want to read for a second a, um, 
uh, just an excerpt from Grafley's journal that just is, uh, gives you an idea of the type of, the type of education that you had here. Grafley writes, everything in the modeling room was confusion before Chapu came. A small, medium-sized man with a pointed chin beard and mustache. Not a word spoken as he went up to a bust. There he was, criticizing with the rest of the class grouped around, swallowing every sentence. Chapu gave me a complimentary criticism, saying that I showed my work, uh, that I showed by my work, which was fleshy, that I had considerable knowledge, and that I used this more than I had copied the model. The boys said it was not every day that he scattered compliments. The reason I wanted to, to read a little bit of that is um, this starts to set the stage for uh, the type of professor that Grafley would wind up being later on in life. Um, Chapu was an intimidating figure, uh, along with um, uh, a few other French artists who I'll get to in a minute. Uh, he was sort of one of the, the superstars of the French Academy. Uh, and Grafley got taken under his wing a little bit, and, and uh, as I said, was initially, um, sorry, I have to keep advancing, uh, was initially a bit frightened by him, but uh, he, he played a big role in Grafley's development as an artist and as a teacher. So he used to tell him things like uh, how Grafley would finish too soon and to look for the, the, the larger things or, or the larger movements in the clay body uh, to stop looking so much at the details, uh, that sort of thing. And Grafley was so taken by Chapu that uh, at one point he wrote in a letter home that he would pit Chapu's uh, Joan of Arc against any of, uh, any of Michelangelo's sculptures. He was just, you know, he was his, he was like, my teacher's the man, he's, you know, he could take anybody. Uh, this is another example of uh, Chapu's work, just something a little bit more <coughs> monumental. And these are the types of things that uh, Grafley would have been, would have been seeing. There was a, there was a tradition of sculpture at this time of um, monumental pieces. So, uh, there was a lot of public funding and, and it was sort of a, uh, it was a time when a lot of money was going toward really lavish projects. Let's see here, all right. Uh, in 1889, uh, this gentleman, William Adolphe Bougereau, uh, opened up his studio to uh, Parisian art students, which was a huge deal. Um, Bougereau, if, if you've never heard his name before, he was kind of the, in the 20th century, he's become something of the whipping boy in, the, uh, in the, the, the narrative of the Impressionists. When you hear about those big bad academy types who were, who were leaving all the, the struggling artists out in the cold, this guy was getting adoration just like, he, Paris was in love with him. This was the, the height of his career. So. Uh, at that time, to be allowed into his studio and to see what he was working on was, uh, was a formative experience for Grafley. He writes about it in his letters home. Uh, he mentions seeing uh, this, this piece in the corner of, uh, of Bougereau's studio, uh, and he was deeply impressed by it. it was an, it's an actually an early piece. I was surprised. I'd seen this piece before, but uh, Bougereau had done it when he was only in his 20s, so uh, he must, by this point, Bougereau was quite old during this visit, so he must have held on to it for a while. But um, at any rate, the other thing that he noticed in this, in Bougereau's studio was how spare it was, that it was a large space that was meant for the creation of artwork and not for, for much else, which he was, I, maybe he, he might have been surprised by, considering that Bougereau was something of a celebrity at the time. Maybe he would have thought it would have been more of a parlor idea or something like that. S around this time, um, Paris was a, a thriving mass of art students in the 1880s, and uh, even though Grafley, with his, with his background at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, even though that gave him a good uh, a, a foundation from which to, to work from in getting into the Academy Julienne, uh, he still felt like he wasn't going to be satisfied until he got into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. So that's what this is here. This is the school that I was saying has a, had that that massive entrance exam. Um, so he'd improved enough for Chapu to take notice, but he really wanted the rest of Paris or the rest of the world to notice. Um, so he set his sights on the impossible. Uh, he made arrangements to take the entrance exam, and uh, he was ultimately denied. And he ended up taking the exam, I believe, three times and, uh, and didn't get accepted on any of the times. But 
Fortunately for him, uh, his, the first time that he applied, his disappointment was tempered when uh, Chapu had invited him for a, um, to be involved in a project that he was working on in the 1889 World's Fair in Paris. Here we go, all right. Um, the 1889 World's Fair was, uh, is actually the, the World's Fair that the Eiffel Tower was, was installed for. It was a huge deal. And um, this piece here, which is called Steam Confined by Man, which is a really great 1880s <laughs> Beaux-Arts title, like they didn't mess around. Um, it's actually, f the, the final piece here is 40 feet tall. You can see in com by comparison how little the people are. Um, it's, it was massive. And on the other side is that this other artist made uh, <coughs> Uh, electricity confined by man. <laughs> so uh, it, w it was outside the, uh, the Palace of Machinery here where uh, there were all sorts of steam <laughs> engines and electric powered things. The, uh, it was this specific pavilion was a showcase of, of technology, it was sort of the future. So thus, steam power here being personified by a nude woman rising from a cauldron. Here's this muscular blacksmith that's supposed to be a stand-in for man who is putting a shackle on her which is again really 1880s also. <laughs> but at any rate, Chapu, uh, he, Chapu had the design worked out and as, you, and as you'll, if any of you are, are familiar with how you get to a monumental size sculpture, you start with a small maquette and which might be a certain percentage size, small, a certain fraction of what you want your finished piece to be and you gradually size it up. And as details where you may have made made a mark with a thumb when something's this big, by the time that it's life size, your thumbprint needs to be fleshed out a little bit. So you needed, you needed other artists to, uh, to come in and help you model and help you, you sculpt. And so this was the, uh, what Grayfully was invited to work on. Chapu had admired his work enough to invite him to work on this, and that was a, a huge deal for Grayfully. And it ended up being a turning point in his own career because all of a sudden he's something of a rock star because here he's been playing at least a, a small part but still a part in the uh, 1889 World's Fair. So um, just to give a little bit more flavor of the world that Grayfully was a part of, um, and uh, this is also a little bit of self-indulgence because I, I saw this piece at the Metropolitan Museum when I was in college and I was like almost knocked over. I don't know if it's everybody's cup of tea, but I loved it. And when I saw Grayfully calls this piece out specifically in one of his, uh, in one of his letters back to his parents, uh, in 1889, just to set the stage, uh, he had just, the World Fair had just closed and he had been involved in that project. And the, and the projects that went on in the World's Fair were massive, monumental, but also artists from all over. And so then there was just a measly little 1889 Paris Salon, which any other year would have been huge, but this year was just uh, coming, coming from seeing those great works. Uh, Grayfully wrote that he had, at this salon, he had seen some of the worst, as well as some of the best examples of modeling and artwork that he'd ever seen. Um, his, favorite, the fa his favorite painting that he saw, he said, was this painting of Joan of Arc by Jules Bastien Lepage. And he wrote that, he, that Lepage put not mere paint, but his soul on canvas, which I thought it was just interesting. I'm always fascinated to hear what art other artists really liked. Um, and his favorite piece of sculpture was called La Fin de la Rêve, which means the end of the dream, by this guy, Jean Dompte. Um, <coughs> And he, and he describes um, in detail that he loves her hand laying listes, listlessly in her lap and she's staring off into space. Um, and there's sort of this bizarre harpy creature up here. Um, so anyway, uh, so that was the world that he, that he came from. Um, and over the next uh, couple years, he would redouble his efforts at the Academy Julienne. He still stayed on with Chapu and uh, he had sort of a funny formative thing that happened to him that would inform uh, his work for the rest of his life and would impact his students as well. Uh, life masks were really common in, at, at that time, especially for celebrities. You know, there's not, uh, if there wasn't um, photographs, well, th there, there was photography, but not as widespread as today. And oftentimes, taking a life mask of somebody, which is just a fancy way of saying putting plaster on someone's face so that you can then, you have a record of what their face looked like, it was really common. And it was actually, 
common enough uh, where a life masks were taken of an individual and then uh, a lot of times portrait sculptures were made from that, not, not incorporating it, but, um, but looking at it and then trying to translate that. And so Grayfleet tried to make a life mask of one of his friends while in his Paris studio and uh, he was really disappointed with the result. He realized that it, the resulting face had a, a, had a flat, lifeless quality, that there was a lot of vitality in the little hills and valleys of the human face that when heavy, wet plaster was on it was pulled down. And what that made him realize is that what made a person's face unique was more than just the arrangement of, their, of the named features, the features that are commonly known, like the eyes, nose, and mouth, uh, but that there's, there's a lot to the other structures, some of which are soft, some of which are hard and made of bone, <coughs> that, that uh, a person's head or face is a unique system uh, that, that is basically, that the back of the head is as important as the front and everything in between is important. Because, and uh, as, as a way of an example, neither of these are, are by Grafley, but uh, I just I wanted to illustrate to you guys, this is a life mask that was taken of Beethoven um, and this is a sculpture that, a, uh, that around the same time a, uh, a sculptor had done of Beethoven. And it may be sort of a funny thing to point out, but even just looking at the grooves in the forehead here, like how much power and mass there is, how much character, and then here how sunken in and it, it doesn't have any vitality to it. And how, how silly Grafley must have thought that, that this essentially mask that doesn't have the ears, doesn't have the, 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 the mass of the skull or the neck or anything, that that is what Beethoven looks like, that, that, all you that this is what someone looks like. And Grafley's like, no, this is what they look like. So that would inform uh, a, a new aesthetic that Grafley would develop and pass on to each and every one of his students. Walker Hancock talks about it a lot in his memoir. Weems, when we, when we get to her in a couple <laughs> slides, uh, talks about it a little bit as well. So uh, later that same year, Grafley was uh, busily uh, finishing up some of his other works. This is a piece called Daedalus that he had uh, put into a Paris salon. Um, he had received the Prix de Rome for this piece. Uh, meanwhile, word was spreading quickly back in the States that uh, this expatriate sculptor was having great success and was involved with the uh, Paris World's Fair. So commissions started coming in across the country, a lot in Philadelphia, but then also um, ones in, uh, uh, across the nation. So he really divided his, uh, the, the subsequent years up uh, before he started teaching into three types of projects. He was working on public projects like these, which are at the US Customs House in New York. They're still on the facade of the building, I believe. Um, public projects like that. He did monumental projects like this, which was, uh, this is a figure of truth that was at the um, St. Louis, I think St. Louis World's Fair, uh, which has a sort of tragic story that I won't get into now, but if there's time afterwards, it, it broke my heart that it doesn't exist anymore, and it's really sad why, but. Uh, and then portrait studies, which uh, portraits ended up becoming his bread and butter, and uh, the, these other two types of projects were constantly mired in financial difficulties. He found himself in between an architect and a foundry, and he was waiting for money from the architect, the foundry's waiting money for him, and he felt that he was just getting a check from one and handing it to the other, and any time there was creative differences that would arise, if, if something needed to be changed, he would have to notify everybody, and uh, it was a source of discomfort for him for a long time. So uh, these sort of portraits were, were uh, ended up being much more important in his career. Uh, he also found himself at home in a classroom. Uh, he long since realized that uh, a critique was only as useful as it was honest. Um, so uh, at the time, uh, he, the time that he spent under great uncompromising figures like Aikens and uh, Bougereau and Chapu, Bougereau, by, by the way, he studied drawing with Bougereau, which I neglected to mention, but he'd, so he'd spent time working with him as well. Uh, it left him with uh, this mind, if you'll forgive the pun, like a mind like a chisel. He would just, he would try to cut to the heart of whatever needed to be said about a particular piece. And so as a teacher, that was, uh, that was a really important trait to have. 
Uh, he wasn't afraid of, of getting on someone's bad side if it meant at least being honest with them and helping them improve as an artist. Um, so as early as 1892, he signed on to teach figurative sculpture at his old school, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where he ended up teaching until the time of his death, so for about 30, I think over 30 years. Um, and the effect that he had on students was noticeable. Um, he developed a reputation for his brutal critiques. Uh, and Walker Hancock, a former student of Grayfully, once said that the best you could ever expect to get from him, what was high praise, is when Grayfully once said to him, well, you're not going to be ashamed of that. <laughs> so that's kind of the, uh, that's the sort of thing. So here's, here's Grayfully hanging out, looking like he owns the joint. So around 1900, uh, his old uh, school friends had, had introduced him to the Boston art crowd. And uh, he ended up buying a, a little place on Folly Cove, which for a while just operated as his, as his summer house. It was sort of a retreat in the quiet uh, woods north of Boston. Uh, but eventually became sort of a, a home base for him. It was a really important studio that he, did, that he spent a lot of time in, and did some of his best work in. And so around 1915, while he was still teaching at the Pennsylvania Academy, he joined uh, the Boston Museum School's faculty. And he, he ran the class in sort of a funny way that reflected some of the practices that he saw in the French academies, whereby he would spend a week and a half down in Philadelphia, and then he would come up for a few days to Boston, would check in with his class, give critiques uh, for a couple days, spend some days in Lanesville, and then go back to Philadelphia. And for just over 20 years, I guess maybe 24 years, he did this routine. He came up every two weeks between uh, Philadelphia and, and uh, Folly Cove, which that's a lot of travel, especially uh, in those years. But at any rate, um, the, Boston, uh, the Boston Museum School, or the Museum of Fine Arts, rather, was uh, run in those times, in those days, by this gentleman, Gardner Martin Lane. Uh, and Lane was a Boston socialite. Uh, he was a lover of the arts, obviously. He was the president of the Museum of Fine Arts Board. Um, his wife was a native Southerner uh, who was something of a social butterfly. She loved Boston high society and parlor talks and all that sort of thing. And uh, they only had one daughter, and they, uh, they ended up settling here in Manchester by the sea in this house, the Chimneys, which uh, I don't know how many of you are local to Manchester by the sea, but you may be familiar th with, with this house. They said they had a fondness for fireplaces, and it has seven. So the effect that it had on the roof line explains the name, the Chimneys. Um, this is the, the cove out back. These are some of the grounds. Um, a uh, really breathtaking estate. And like I was starting to say, they had a daughter named <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> so this is Catherine. Uh, <laughs> uh, she was born in 1899. So Grayfully was born in 1862, so just as an idea of, um, she, it's really, she's got one of the years that's really easy to figure out how old she was in, in, at a particular time. Like, how old was she in 1920? 20, 21. Um, when she was 15, her father, Gardner, uh, took her on a tour of Europe. Um, one of the places they stopped was at John Singer Sargent's studio, uh, because uh, this is in 1914. Uh, Sargent at the time was finishing up the murals for the uh, Boston Public Library, and uh, Gardner had designs on him maybe doing similar murals for the, um, for the Museum of Fine Arts. And so during this meeting, Catherine remembers, again, she was 15, she remembers her father talking about it. And within a couple years, the plans were in the works, and we'll see those in a second. Um, but the, uh, an important thing that happened here uh, was that, I guess it, the, you can't see it in this photo, but uh, she remembers seeing a small plaster horse that was like a, like a flayed horse, I guess. You could see the musculature in Sargent's, in Sargent's studio. And uh, she asked her father after they had left, when they were continuing to bounce around Europe, uh, if, if, she, if he could find one like it 
and I think he found one in, in Bohemia or something like that, which uh, she ended up, when she writes her memoirs in the 80s, she said that it was, it was in her, uh, uh, never left her studio for her whole life, which is really sweet. Um, at any rate, it was the first time she, she'd ever been to an artist studio and was really impressed by Sargent. Um, just as a quick thing, these are, um, the, these are the murals that eventually resulted from that meeting, uh, which are still <laughs> currently today in the rotunda of the, of the Museum of Fine Arts. So it's kind of fun that they were talked about at a time with <coughs> that was important in, in Weems' life. Uh, anyway, unfortunately, uh, that was right around the outbreak of World War I, and uh, it was kind of stressful getting around. They traveled through Austria at one point, and uh, her father had, a, had some sort of uh, lung condition, I believe. And so they tried to book passage as quickly as they could. And then uh, when they made it home, uh, her father ended up passing away uh, within, I think, a few weeks of getting home. So it was a, 1914 was a, uh, was a memorable year for, for Catherine. And uh, she and her father were very close, so that came as a big blow to her. Um, Shortly before her father died, he had commissioned another sculptor, uh, sculptor uh, Richard Reckia, who's a, a, a Rockport sculptor, to, uh, he commissioned him to do something for, for his wife, and uh, ended up passing away before Reckia was finished. And so I, I don't know if it was as a, um, maybe a, a cons uh, as a small gift for a grieving family or something, but when Reckia delivered the commission piece when it was finished to the widow and, and, the, and the young daughter, Catherine, he also brought a small box of modeling clay for Catherine just as a gift. Uh, and that was the first time that she'd ever touched clay, and that ended up being uh, uh, changing the course, not only of her life, but you could argue of uh, uh, the development of art in New England in the 20th century. Anyway, um, within a few years of getting that box of clay, oh, here's Richard Reckie. I forgot I had a, had a slide just for, just for kicks. Um, uh, within a few uh, years of getting that box of clay, she ends up taking classes or, or signing up to take classes at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. So now we see how it's sort of circling back to Grayfully a little bit. Um, the, the building, so this is uh, the museum when it first moved to Huntington Ave. And the building that the school was in for this span of time was a little temporary structure over here that her father had financed. Um, and when she got there, when she got to class for the first time, one of her classmates had told her, they had had sort of a temporary instructor who was subbing in, and, and Catherine liked him quite a lot. And one of her students said, well, you're not going to like the, the teacher that we get like every couple weeks, Mr. Grafley. He can be, he's a perfectionist, and he can be caustic. Um, so she was given a warning about him. And likewise, uh, she finds out later that, that he was given a similar warning about her. <laughs> Um, that he was told that there was a young woman who was going to be starting in one of his classes and that, uh, that he'd better be nice to her because her father built the building that they're doing the sculpture <laughs> classes in. Which for him, as somebody who, you know, was, uh, you know, had had a lifetime of people being sort of short and brutal and honest and, and you know, he's maybe thinking to himself like, you know, I'm trying to teach these kids how to get better at sculpture. How, and that's not my style to be nice to her. Like, if, she, if her stuff's bad, her stuff's going to be bad. So anyway, he gratefully was gratefully, and their first interaction was him walking up to her model stand, looking at her twisted mass of clay, and just telling her, Miss Weems, that's too poor to critique. Um, which, which, for her, um, could be, you know, if she, it, if she was a different type of person, uh, that could have been the end of it, but she writes in her memoirs that, quote, instead of being angry or mortified, I assumed this is the way he dealt with every beginner, and I inwardly resolved to show him something better, something more individual, and, I, and it, even if it took months before I could hold his attention. Um, this is, I, w I, I don't, there's no surviving example of what that piece looked like, unfortunately. This is one of the earliest pieces that I could find of Weems that w would look like something that would have been happening in his class. He was doing figurative work. Um, so this is around the years that, uh, this, uh, this would have been her first year, I guess, with him. So just uh, as an example of that. So um, she did stick with it, and she tried as hard as she could. She, uh, she suffered through a bunch of figurative pieces and portrait studies until the end of the semester. And then over the summer, she started a project um, uh, that was 
of her grandfather. Uh, she loved her grandfather, this is her mother's father, Basil Leno Gildersleeve, um, and she worked all summer on this sculpture, and by the end of the summer, her mom was falling over herself about it. Her mom was loving it, and uh, Weems writes that she thought, that Weems thought it looked like a wizened orange. <laughs> and so, just for comparison, that's why I ended up having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, it, it led actually to an interesting critique. So, by this point, uh, she had been in the class for a while, and she made a habit of trying to truck her projects over to Folly Cove um, if it, during the summer. So, she brought this, she went with her mother to Folly Cove to see Gravely, and Gravely put it on his model stand, and he looked at it in good light, and he looked at it for a long time, and the studio was silent, and she remembers her mom broke the silence and said, it really is a great likeness, that's, that's, uh, that's her grandfather's eyes, and that's her grandfather's nose, and that's her grandfather's beard, and that's her grandfather's ears, which, if we think back to the life mask, it's like the worst thing to say to Gravely of all, of all people. So, Gravely responds that, yeah, you're right, that's her grandfather's eyes, that's her grandfather's nose, but where are they? They're floating in space, they're in this mass of clay, like what, like what is all this stuff up here? Like, so, in that moment, Catherine realized, uh, she started to realize the same sort of thing, and that was a, it was the linchpin of his artistic philosophy, uh, sp at least with portraiture, that there are, there's an important relationship of forms, that there's underlying structures that unify things, and, uh, and her mother was, she was uh, heartbroken because her, her daughter had spent all summer working on this thing and her professor just <laughs> cut it up with a word. But for, um, for Weems, she started to realize that, the on, that if for as brutal as some of these critiques were, they were always worth it, that there was always some, some truthful thing that would help drive the, the work forward and that, and that these critiques were never, Grafley's like sour words, were never offered with an intent to insult her, but were meant to be like, these are the things that you've done poorly, I suggest you address those. Um, so she started keeping detailed notes of all of these critiques, and uh, in the foreword of her memoir, Walker Hancock recalls that of all Gravely students, she, had, she kept notebook after notebook of things that he said verbatim, and Hancock jokes that if, that if somebody never went to, if someone never went to study sculpture at school and only had Weems gravely notes that they would probably have a pretty damn good education. So that's kind of interesting. It, it tells you a little bit about him and also a lot about Catherine and the type of person she was. Um, there is a similar uh, formative moment came uh, when I, I don't have an, I couldn't find an image of this. I don't know if it survives or not, but she had a friend who she described as having sort of noble looking features and she wanted very badly to do a portrait of her friend that kind of, um, that, that highlighted those features. So she did the sculpture of her friend, ended up bringing it to Grafley, um, or was planning on bringing it to Grafley, but it was too heavy to move. So she hollowed it out, and she mixed up sort of a wet plaster, put a little extra water so the plaster was a little lighter, and, and then filled in the, the hole in the back of the bust and plugged it up with clay, just so it wasn't solid clay, so it was easier to transport. Next day, brings it to Grafley, and he puts it on his model stand. She goes with, with her friend, and uh, Grafley's looking at it under the light, and then takes a wire and slashes the face off because he needed to, to move the face back further, I guess. It's fairly common to do that with, with sculpture, just to move things. Anyway, he slashes it open and out gushes this plaster all over him, all over what, what Weems described as his immaculate shoes, an immaculate studio, and she's mortified. Um, and right before that, I think is the, what he said right before he slashed it, he asked what her friend thought of her, and she said, I don't know why, and he said, because he's going to like you a lot less after he hears what I'm about to say. <laughs> so she thought it was like the end of the world, and what ended up happening is he was yelling, said, you need to figure out how to mix plaster, and then he started cracking up, went into the corner of the studio and brought out three glasses and a bottle of brandy, and he's like, Miss Lane, we got to figure this out. <laughs> so that was the first moment that they really became friends. Uh, she, she remembers him fondly. From that moment on, it was not just someone who, who she was terrified of or, or trying to impress, but really became, uh, she, she realized that he was taking stock in her as an individual. So anyway, 
this painting uh, is by Catherine, so this is around this time now, we've made it to about 1920. So this was by another Manchester artist and resident, Charles Hopkinson, um, who was a neighbor for the most part. I think maybe a, you guys might be able to help, but I think just a couple houses away. Um, I think this is a really interesting painting, not only because it's an intersection of two of Manchester's most important artists, um, but also what it says about Weems, uh, or, or Ka Catherine Lane, I guess she's not Weems yet, but um, it's, I think it's really fascinating the way that, he, the way that she's posed in the decor of the room and this, this gown that she's in. She's, she's sitting, but she's almost like implying, there's this implication of a curtsy or something like that. But she sort of has a restlessness in her expression that is almost says like, let's get this over with. <laughs> um, and it's, and it, it sort of, uh, it to me symbolizes this divide between her and her mother who was a really dominant force in her life and was always trying to steer her away from her artwork because she was m terrified that people were going to think Catherine was weird because she was putting so much stock in her artwork. She would always tell her like, don't, now don't take this stuff too seriously or people are going to think that you're odd. Uh, and she remembers that aside from the approval of her grandfather's bust, The Wizened Orange, uh, she realized in looking back through her own diaries that there's never any mention of her mom praising any of her sculpture. Um, she knew that uh, her mom was ambitious for her socially, and that she wanted her to cultivate her voice, to be able to play the piano, to dance beautifully and throw a great party. Um, and she wanted her to have many bows and wanted them to be eligible. But uh, if she did any more than dabble in the arts, uh, she was pretty apprehensive that, uh, and that Catherine would be thought odd. So anyway, I think it's fascinating to know that and see this painting that right at the time when she had been sculpting for a few years, uh, she sort of, sort of starts leading this double life where on the one hand, she is, uh, she, in the evening, she's like this dazzling socialite that has to, to do all the stuff that her mother says and, and she's, you know, Beacon Hill in Boston and uh, really involved in the, in the upper crust. And then on the other hand, uh, she's spending the days as this really determined, no-nonsense, like, gritty sculptor who is sort of like uh, just working hard and could care less if, if somebody says the right thing to her. So she became very wary of social praise. Um, so uh, through the ensuing months, she, she continued to improve as a sculptor, and uh, eventually she even writes that she started to become eager f to get knocked down a couple of pegs by Grafley at the end of a long weekend of like social engagements where, ev where nobody's saying what they really mean, everybody's trying to be polite, and then you get into Grafley's class and he just straight shoot her and she's like, oh, okay, now I know where I stand. So I think there was, there was something of that that uh, she was drawn to. Um, and I realized I am, I gotta pick it up, sorry. I'm, lo I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking, all right, okay. <laughs> So it was during this early period of study uh, that Catherine began to focus on animal subjects. Uh, under Grafley's tutelage, she also began to refine her understanding of anatomy, which, you know, it was a lineage that got passed down from Thomas Eakins to her, or to, from Eakins to Grafley to her, um, that to understand the, the sort of the substructures at, at the different muscles as, as an animal moves, I mean, the, that stroboscopic photo that we saw earlier for just a person walking, that's one thing, because you can ask somebody to stop, like you could ask a human being to stop in any given pose, but an animal keeps moving. So in order to really understand how to sculpt an animal, and this goes for other animal sculptors as well, like Anna Hyde Huntington, who we'll talk about in a second, uh, you need to understand what muscle groups are moving and what's sort of the dominant force of what's, uh, what's generating some kind of gesture, because gesture is really important in sculpture and drawing. Um, so this is a drawing that she, that, that uh, Catherine had made actually, and I think it's, it's really cool to see, uh, to see this. Um, so the, this refined uh, animal aesthetic led to her having uh, a turning point in her life that was sort of disguised as afternoon tea. Uh, her and her mom were, uh, they were spending the winter in New York and uh, Anna Hyatt Huntington, or a, at the time Anna Von Hyatt, um, who you, all, you guys may know from this uh, sculpture, Joan of Arc in Gloucester, this is it being installed. And it's funny enough, we're, this is actually happened the same year. Uh, 
Anna Hyatt Huntington had uh, visited Catherine and her mom in New York for tea and had then invited Catherine to come visit her studio, which was, which was also in New York. She was sharing it with another uh, very well-known sculptor, uh, Brenda Putnam. And she told Catherine to bring her things and to be ready, for be ready to work. Um, and this is, this is Brenda Putnam. When Catherine got there, she went over there the next day, brought her supplies, and uh, Brenda told her that she had, in, she had intentions on, on helping her, uh, help tutor her in anatomy. So when she goes back to Grayfleet's class, she'd be like, she would have spent the summer uh, really improving. And they carved out a spot in the studio for her, and she spent, it's kind of hard to tell from the, from, from the, um, the correspondence, but it looks like maybe at least uh, a couple months uh, studying and working in the studio with the two of them. And uh, they also introduced her to what it, what it meant to be involved in the New York art scene. They went to the National Sculpture Society, they attended lectures, they went to a lot of exhibit openings, <laughs> and they uh, brought her to the Bronx Zoo as well, which is a really important uh, place for Catherine, uh, because it was at the Bronx Zoo that she started doing a lot of the work that we now know her for. So this is a, um, this is a baby elephant that she started working on Anna Hyatt Huntington was close friends with the director of the zoo and uh, introduced Catherine. He gave her a free pass. She could go to any of the animal enclosures and the, the keepers would like pull up a stool for her and she could work. So she sort of fell in love with this little, this little elephant that uh, had lost its mother and um, ended up uh, being really happy with it. Catherine gave her high praise and they, ended up going to see another show where she looked at some rhinoceroses. And as a 21st century person in the nas post-National Geographic world, like a rhinoceros doesn't seem that <laughs> mind-blowing. But in the 1920s in America, it was like a really bizarre animal. Uh, so she loved this uh, rhinoceros. And uh, it was, so this was a real period of growth for Anna. And uh, she, was, she was working incredibly hard, and you could almost say that she was overworking, because by the end of that winter, she ended up coming down with the flu. And uh, um, when she got back here to, to Manchester, uh, she started skipping classes at the museum school, which her mom was thrilled about, because she was like, oh, finally, she's gotten out of this <laughs> art phase. But one guy who was not thrilled about it was this gentleman. Um, so. On one of his visits to the class, he had, he had learned from the monitors that she hadn't been to class in a couple weeks or something like that. So she, he, he tracked her down to her, to her house in Manchester and I guess went on a tirade, apparently. And, uh, and she felt like she deserved it, but at the same time, it wasn't that she was cutting class because she was quitting sculpting, because that's, I guess that must have been what he thought, but she was actually working as a professional. She was sharing a studio with two other professional sculptors who were, who were uh, well established. And apparently mid tirade, he sees this and he suddenly is like, oh my God, wait a minute, you, you gotta, he, he realizes that she's working and, and he convinces her that she has to send it in to the Pennsylvania Academy Salon Show, where it ended up winning a bronze, I believe. And uh, a couple, uh, about a month later, he brings a Pennsylvania newspaper that has a photo of it on the, uh, on the heading of the art notes. He brought a, a newspaper all the way from Philadelphia and quietly handed it to her. So she was, so she was thrilled. Um, we're getting toward the end here, sorry. <laughs> Brevity is not one of my strong suits. Uh, so <laughs> as, time, as time went on, Catherine kept working and eventually, um, and, and, and improving, and eventually she starts to think uh, that she might want her own studio. She'd been sculpting out of the stable at, uh, at the chimneys, which is, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but eventually she's thinking, well, maybe it, it was nice having a studio in New York, I guess. So she decides to get one in Boston and she, she uh, ends up paying Anna Hyatt Huntington a visit in Anasquam and gets her opinion and says, you know, should, it, does this sound like a good idea? And over the course of the conversation, <laughs> Anna, Anna Hyatt Huntington says something really interesting to her. She says to take it easy on Grafley, that uh, to not bleed him dry, which which just to pause for a moment in the context of this talk, I think is really, is kind of an interesting thing to note um, because uh, uh, Catherine follows this in her memoir by saying, 
Being on my own didn't mean that I needed any less help from Mr. Grafley. I went to the museum school for his fortnightly visits, and on my first October, we missed each other, and I returned in disappointment to my new studio. But he tracked me there and gave me a good criticism. He was pleased with one piece and called it a bully piece of work. High praise. So the fact that, that uh, Anna Huntington would, would even mention Grafley and be like, you need to settle down, it, it uh, for me, highlights this idea that, that these two were really important to one another, that cl very clearly Grafley had, uh, had a big, was exerting a big influence on, on Weems' life, and that, uh, you know, that it, that it showed that even Anna Huntington could, could see that. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but at the same time, she could never be sure of his approval. For instance, uh, when she was working on this piece, she brought it to Grafley at one point. This is when she was feeling pretty good, winning some awards. And uh, Grafley looks at it in silence for a while, and he puts his finger right here and says, what do you call that? And she said, well, that's the lion's mane. And he says, I call it seaweed. <laughs> so, he <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was always that kind of thing. To, uh, and so then she said she went home. He, told, he, he reminded her to work in broad, m broad masses and planes and movements and things. And she said, after that, I could model a lion's mane with my eyes closed. Um, in the mid-20s, Catherine's childhood friend, Harry Crosby, paid her a visit. Um, they had grown up together. He was uh, in the American Field Service in World War I. He's part of that lost generation. Um, and I guess after, after the war, Played kind. Of, he had sort of an eccentric life. He uh, um, he has a Wikipedia page even, which I thought was sort of surprising. That talks about how he wrote poetry that had a lot of sun imagery, and he was obsessed with death or something. Anyway, uh, he was really eccentric and came to visit Catherine at one point and brought this pri his prize whippet that that had run won some races, and uh, Catherine remembers seeing them run together on Singing Beach, and. Uh, she thought it was the most beautiful whippet that she'd ever seen. For anyone who doesn't know a whippet, it's sort of, it's like a, kind of like a greyhound. Um, and uh, so she had to sculpt it. And uh, its name was Narcisse Noir. So over the course of a couple weeks, she went over to the Crosby's house and uh, ended up sculpting it. And it the dog would occasionally lie down and stretch its slender legs out and uh, put its high head up, and that's the pose that uh, Catherine wanted to capture. Um, I think this piece is a masterpiece. I think this is the best thing that she ever sculpted. Um, I really love it. And it sort of marks a, um, sort of epitomizes her mature style, because Catherine has a, she has a real stylistic way of arranging things with long lines. And when I look at this piece, I mean, it almost conjures some ideas of ancient Egypt, but through like an Art Deco lens in the same way that maybe someone like Manship would have looked at archaic Greek sculpture through this sort of modern lens. But at the same time, she hasn't sacrificed any of the, the subtleties or any of those underlying substructures, the anatomical nuances. It's all there. And that's what I think is amazing about this is that it's not super, too, super stylized, so stylized that you can't see the ribs or the spine or anything, but it's, it's a very naturalistic piece, but it's like she's hit upon a, a mature style, which is really, really amazing. And so uh, she submitted it to the 1927 Pennsylvania Academy Winter Show, was dreading a rejection letter, and instead she received a long distance call saying that it won the most prestigious award at the exhibit, which is like the Widener Gold Memorial. Um, so only a couple more slides, literally like three. <laughs> um, so she had wondered if, because Grafley was on the selection committee, if her uh, stern and uncompromising friend had had a hand in this, uh, in this selection. Um, but privately, she felt like she had finally crossed the threshold, that she was no longer an amateur, but that she, had, that she was a professional working artist. Um, so since she'd known him, as I said it earlier, Grafley was making this trip back and forth. And uh, finally, Weems, in, or Catherine, uh, decides to make this trip herself. So she and a friend go to Pennsylvania, or go to Philadelphia. They're met by Grafley at the station. He gives them a tour of the entire exhibit. He gives them a tour of his classrooms at the Pennsylvania Academy. Ends up taking them out to lunch at the club. 
and uh, tells her that of all the students that he, that uh, tells her friend that of all the students, uh, her work interests him like as much as anybody, uh, which is really cool. Um, so, uh, so from then on, really, uh, Catherine did cross a threshold. Uh, she continued to pursue her own projects uh, and her own unique vision and style. Uh, the success of Narcisse Noir, th though a small success, uh, it was really momentous for her at the time that it came, but it would wind up being dwarfed by a lot of others. Uh, she has, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, she has dolphins at the aquarium. She has, her, her name is in almost every like art, major art institution in Boston. She has a, a reading room, I believe, at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. She has a permanent display at the Museum of Science. So she's all over Boston. Uh, but I, I, I guess, um, unfortunately, uh, fate wouldn't allow Grafley to be along uh, for the ride to witness any of his star pupil successes. Um, tragically, about just under two years after that conversation at his club when she visited him in Philadelphia, uh, he ended up getting hit by a car in downtown Philadelphia. He was only 65, I think. It was in 1920, or anyway, he was <laughs> in his 60s. But uh, it, was a, it was a stolen car. It was driven by three underage men. They hit him, knocked him to his feet. He fractured his skull, and they crashed into another car, and, a, and they fled the scene. Um, he was taken to a Philadelphia hospital, and he remained there. They tried to do an operation that was unsuccessful, and he his wounds ended up getting infected and he spent his last days uh, in a hospital bed with visitors coming in, former students, friends of his. Uh, Catherine unfortunately couldn't make it, which is really sad, but um, George Demetrius, who was a mutual friend, uh, had visited and had told her that um, he was talking about her at the, uh, up to the very last and said to make sure she keeps drawing with those long lines in her work and uh, closed closed the thought by saying, I like her. <laughs> so, um, so that's it for the most part. Sorry, we went a little over an hour. <laughs> Sorry to end on a sad note. <laughs> you know, this is somebody I, I literally and, and professionally look up to. <laughs> Isn't it refreshing to have, have somebody a command of the English language as Leon does? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> really? That's a, that's an added bonus. Oh um, well, thank you. Thanks all of you for coming. Uh, in the interest of time, because we've got to move all these chairs back into storage. If, while that's happening, if you want to come up and chat with Leon, I'm sure you'll be more than happy to uh, <laughs> greet you and come over to the Cape Ann Museum and see Leon and see the exhibits there. And thanks again for coming. And now, thank you. you.